Part Five, Chapter Ten of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter Ten. During the entr'acte, a draught of cold air made its way into Ellen's box as the door was opened and Anatole came in, bowing and trying not to disturb anyone. Allow me to present my brother," said Ellen, uneasily glancing from Natasha to Anatole. Natasha turned her pretty, graceful head toward the handsome young man and smiled at him over her shoulder. Anatole, who was as fine-looking near at hand as he was at a distance, sat down by her and said that he had been long wishing for the pleasure of her acquaintance, ever since that Narushkin's ball, where he had seen her and never forgotten her. Kurigin was far cleverer and less affected with women than he was in the society of men. He spoke fluently and simply, and Natasha had a strange and agreeable feeling of ease in the company of this man, about whom so many rumors were current. He was not only not terrible, but his face even wore a naive, jolly, and good-natured smile. Kurigin asked her how she enjoyed the play, and told her how Semyovnova, at the last performance, had gotten a fall while on the stage. "'Do you know, Countess,' said he, suddenly addressing her, as though she were an old acquaintance, we have been arranging a fancy dress party. You ought to take part in it. It will be very jolly. We shall all rendezvous at the Kerrigan's. Please come, won't you? he insisted. In saying this, he did not once take his smiling eyes from her face, her neck, her naked arms. Natasha was not left in doubt of the fact that he admired her. This was agreeable, but somehow she felt constrained and troubled by his presence. When she was not looking at him, she was conscious that he was staring at her shoulders and she involuntarily tried to catch his eyes, so that he might rather fix them on her face. But while she thus looked him in the eyes, she had a terrified consciousness that that barrier of modesty, which she had always felt before, kept other men at a distance, was down between him and her. Without being in the least able to explain it, she was conscious within five minutes that she was on a dangerously intimate footing with this man. She nervously turned a little, for fear he might put his hand on her bare arm, or kiss her on the neck. They talked about the simplest matters, and yet she felt that they were more intimate than she had ever been with any other man. She looked at Ellen and at her father, as though asking them what all this meant, but Ellen was busily engaged in conversation with some general, and paid no heed to her imploring look, and her father's said nothing more to her than what it always said. Happy? Well, I am glad of it. During one of those moments of constraint, while Anatole's prominent eyes were calmly and boldly surveying her, Natasha, in order to break the silence, asked him how he liked Moscow. Natasha asked the question and blushed. It seemed to her all the time that she was doing something unbecoming in talking with him. Anatole smiled, as though to encourage her. At first I was not particularly charmed with Moscow, because what a city ought to have, to be agreeable, is pretty women. Isn't that so? Well, now I like it very much, said he, giving her a significant look. Will you come to our party, Countess? Please do, said he, and stretching out his hand toward her bouquet and lowering his voice, he added in French, You will be the prettiest. Come, my dear Countess, and, as a pledge, give me that flower. Natasha did not realize what he was saying any more than he did, but she had a consciousness that in his incomprehensible words there was an improper meaning. She knew not what reply to make, and turned away, pretending not to have heard him. But the instant that she turned away the thought came to her that he was there behind her, and so near. "'What is he doing now? Is he ashamed of himself? Is he angry? Is it my business to make amends?' she asked herself. She could not refrain from glancing round. She looked straight into his eyes, and his nearness and self-possession, and the good-natured warmth of his smile, overcame her. She gave him an answering smile, and gazed straight into his eyes, and once more she realized, with the feeling of horror, that there was no barrier between them. The curtain again went up. Anatole left the box, calm and serene. Natasha rejoined her father in her own box, but already she was under the dominion of this world into which she had entered. Everything that passed before her eyes now seemed to her perfectly natural, while all her former thoughts concerning her lover and the Princess Maria, and her life in the country, vanished from her mind as though all that had taken place long, long ago. 
In the fourth act there was a strange kind of devil, who sang and gesticulated until a trap beneath him was opened and he disappeared. This was all that Natasha noticed during the fourth act. Something agitated and disturbed her, and the cause of this annoyance was Kuragin, at whom she could not help looking. When they left the theatre, Anatole joined them, summoned their carriage, and helped them to get seated. As he was assisting Natasha, he squeezed her arm above the elbow. Startled and blushing, she looked at him. His brilliant eyes returned her gaze, and he gave her a tender smile. Not until she reached home was Natasha able clearly to realize all that had taken place, and when she suddenly remembered Prince Andrei, she was horror-struck, and as they all sat drinking tea, she groaned aloud and, flushing scarlet, ran from the room. "'My God, I am lost,' she said to herself. "'How could I have let it go so far?' she wondered. Long she sat, hiding her flushed face in her hands, striving to give herself a clear account of what had happened to her, and she could not do so." nor could she explain her feelings. Everything seemed to her dark, obscure, and terrible. Then, in that huge, brilliant auditorium, where Duport, with his bare legs and spangled jacket, capered about on the dampened stage to the sounds of music, and the girls and the old men and Ellen, much decolletée, with her charm and haughty smile, were all applauding and enthusiastically shouting bravo, there, under the protection of this same Ellen, Everything was perfectly clear and simple, but now, alone by herself, it became incomprehensible. What does it mean? What means this fear that I experience in his presence? What means these stings of conscience which I experience now? she asked herself. If only her mother had been there, Natasha would have made confession of all her thoughts before going to bed that night. She knew that Sonya, with her strict and wholesome views, would either entirely fail to understand, or would be horrified by her confession. Natasha accordingly tried, by her own unaided efforts, to settle the question that tormented her. "'Have I really forfeited Prince Andre's love, or not?' she asked herself, and then, with a reassuring smile, she replied to her own question, "'What a fool I am to ask this! What is the sense of it? None! I have done nothing. I was not to blame for this.' "'No one will know about it, and I shall not see him any more,' she said to herself. "'Of course it is evident no harm has been done. "'There is nothing to repent of, and no reason why Prince Andre should not love me just as I am. "'But what do I mean by just as I am? "'Oh, my God! My God! Why is he not here?' "'Natasha grew calm for an instant, but then some instinct told her that, "'even though nothing had happened and no harm had been done,' Still the first purity of her love for Prince Andre was destroyed, and once more she let her imagination bring up her whole conversation with Kuragin, and she recalled his face and his motions, and the tender smile that this handsome, impudent man had given her after he had squeezed her arm. End of chapter 10 Part 5, Chapter 11 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy Translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter 11 Anatole Kuragin was living in Moscow because his father had sent him from Petersburg, where he had been spending more than 20,000 rubles a year, and had accumulated heavy debts as well, which his creditors were trying to obtain from his father. His father explained to him that he would, for the last time, pay one half of his debts, but only on condition of his going to Moscow as adjutant to the governor-general of the city, an appointment which he obtained for him. He advised him to make up his mind at last to try to win the hand of some rich heiress. He suggested the Princess Maria, or Julie Karagina. Anatole consented and went to Moscow, where he took up his residence at Pierre's. At first Pierre received him with scant welcome but at length he became accustomed to him, and occasionally accompanied him on his sprees, and, under the pretense of a loan, gave him money. Anatole, as Shinshin correctly stated the case, had instantly turned the heads of all the girls in Moscow, and particularly by the fact of his affected neglect of them, and his avowed preference for gypsy girls and French actresses, with the leading light of whom, Mademoiselle Georges, it was said, he was on terms of close intimacy." He never failed of a single drinking bout given by Danilov or the other fast men of Moscow. 
he could drink steadily from night till morning, out drinking everyone else. Moreover, he was a constant habitué of all the balls and receptions in the upper circles of society. Rumors were rife of various intrigues of his with married ladies in Moscow, and at the balls he always paid particular court to several. But from young ladies, particularly those who were rich and in the marriage market, most of whom were excessively plain, Anatole kept at a respectful distance, and this arose from the fact, known only to a very few of his most intimate friends, that he had been married two years before. Two years before, while his regiment had been cantoned in Poland, a Polish proprietor of a small estate had forced Anatole to marry his daughter. Anatole had soon after abandoned his wife, and, by engaging to send money periodically, he persuaded his father-in-law to let him pass still as a bachelor. Anatole was always satisfied with his situation, with himself, and with other people. He was instinctively, by his whole nature, convinced that it was entirely impossible for him to lead another manner of existence, and that he had never in his life done anything wrong. He was in no condition to ponder on the effect that his behavior might have on others, or what might be the result of his behaving in this, that, or the other way. He was persuaded that, just as the duck was so created as always to be in the water, in the same way he was created by God for the purpose of living with an income of 30,000 rubles a year, and of occupying the highest pinnacle of society. He was so firmly grounded in this opinion, that other people also, when he saw them, shared in his conviction, and never thought of refusing him either the foremost place in society, or the money which he took of any one he met, without ever thinking of repaying it. He was no gambler, at least, he never showed sordid love for gain, he was not ostentatious. It was absolutely a matter of indifference to him what men thought of him. Still less was he open to the charge of ambition. Many times he had annoyed his father by injuring his own prospects, and he always made sport of dignities. He was not stingy, and he never refused anyone who asked a favor of him. All that he cared for was a good time, and women, and, as, according to his opinion, there was nothing ignoble in these tastes, and he could not calculate the consequence for other people of the gratification of these tastes of his, he therefore considered himself irreproachable, sincerely scorned ordinary scoundrels and base men, and held his head high with a tranquil conscience. Debauchees, those male Magdalens, have a secret feeling of blamelessness, such as is peculiar to the frail sisterhood, and it is based in the same hope of forgiveness. She shall be forgiven much, for she hath loved much, and he shall be forgiven much, because he hath enjoyed much. Dolokhov, back again in Moscow, after his exile and his adventures in Persia, and once more leading a dissipated and luxurious life, and playing high, naturally became intimate with his old Petersburg companion, Kuragin, and made use of him for his own ends. Anatole really liked Dolokhov for his wit, intelligence, and audacity. Dolokhov, who found the name, the notability, and the connections of Anatole Kuragin an admirable decoy for attracting rich young fellows into his clutches, made use of him, and got enjoyment out of him without letting him suspect it. Besides the financial purpose for which Anatole served him, the act itself of controlling the will of another was an enjoyment, a habit, a necessity for Dolokhov. Natasha had made a deep impression on Kuragin. At supper after the opera, with all the enthusiasm of a connoisseur, he praised to Dolokhov her arms, her shoulders, her feet, and her hair, and he expressed his intention of making love to her. The possible consequences of such love-making Anatole did not stop to consider, nor was it in him to foresee them any more than in any other of his escapades. "'Yes, she's pretty, my dear fellow, but she's not for us,' said Dolokhov. "'I'm going to tell my sister to invite her to dinner. How's that?' suggested Anatole. "'You had better wait till she's married.' "'You know,' said Anatole, "'je dois les petites filles. "'You can turn their heads so quick. "'You have already fallen into the hands of one petite filet, "'said Dolokhov, who knew about Anatole's marriage. "'See?' "'Well, can't get caught a second time, eh?' "'replied Anatole, good-naturedly laughing. "'End of chapter 11《パート5》Chapter 12 of *War and Peace* by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter 12. The next day, the Rostovs stayed at home, and no one came to see them. 
Maria Dmitrievna had a confidential conversation with her father, taking pains to keep it secret from Natasha, who nevertheless suspected that they were discussing the old prince and concocting some scheme. It disquieted and humiliated her. She was every moment expecting Prince Andrei to come, and twice that day she sent the Dvornik to the Balkonskys to learn if he had arrived. But he was still absent. It was now more trying to her than during the first days of his absence. Her impatience and melancholy thoughts about him were intensified by an unpleasant recollection of her interview with the Princess Maria and the scene with the old prince, as well as by a vague and undefinable fear and uneasiness. She had a notion that either he would not come at all, or that before he came something would happen. She found it impossible, as before, to have calm and collected thoughts about him when alone by herself. As soon as her thoughts turned to him, her recollections of him were confused by recollections of the old prince, of the Princess Maria, of the operatic performance, and of Kurigan. Again the question arose whether she was not to blame, whether her troth plighted to Prince Andrei was not already broken, and again she would picture to herself, even to the most trifling details, every word, every gesture, every slightest shadow in the play of expression on the face of that man who had succeeded in arousing in her such a terrible and inexplicable feeling. In the eyes of the home circle, Natasha seemed livelier than usual, but she was far from being as calm and happy as she had been before. On Sunday morning, Maria Dmitrievna proposed to her guests to attend Mass at the parish chapel of Uspeni Namohiltsak. I don't like these fashionable churches, said she, evidently priding herself on her independence. God is everywhere one. We have an excellent pope and deacon as well, and the service is well performed. What kind of worship is it to have concerts given in the choir? I don't like it. It's mischievous nonsense. Maria Dmitrievna liked Sundays, and had them kept as high festivals. Her house was thoroughly washed and cleaned on Saturday. Neither she nor the people within her gates did any work. They wore their best clothes, and all went to Mass. On Sunday she had prepared an extra fine dinner, and her servants were provided with vodka and a roasted goose or a suckling pig but nothing in the whole house gave more decided evidence of its being a holiday than Maria Dmitrievna's broad, stern face, which on this occasion wore an unchangeable expression of solemn festivity. After Mass, while they were drinking their coffee in the drawing-room, where the furniture covers had been removed, a servant announced to Maria Dmitrievna that the carriage was at the door. She drew a long face and, putting on her best shawl, in which she always paid visits, got up and announced that she was going to see Prince Nikolai Andreevich Bolkonsky to have an understanding with him in regard to Natasha. After Maria Dmitrievna had taken her departure, a modiste from Madame Chalmé's came to try on the young lady's new dresses, and Natasha, retiring to the next room and shutting the door, was very glad of the diversion. Just as she had put on a hastily basted and still sleeveless waist, and was standing in front of the mirror, bending her head around to see how the back fitted, she heard in the drawing-room the lively tones of her father's voice, mingled with those of a woman, and it made her blush. It was Ellen's voice. Natasha had not time to take off the experimental waist before the door opened, and into the room came the Countess Buzakaya, beaming with a good-natured and flattering smile, and wearing a dark purple velvet dress with a high collar. Ah, Medelicieuse, she exclaimed to the blushing Natasha. Charmant. No, she is quite unlike anyone else, my dear Count, said she, turning to the Count who followed her in. The idea of living in Moscow and not going anywhere. No, I shall not let you off. This evening Mademoiselle Georges is going to recite for me, and we shall have a crowd, and if you don't bring your beauties, who are far better than Mademoiselle Georges, I shall never forgive you. My husband is away. He has gone to Tver, otherwise I should send him for you. Do not fail to come. Don't fail. At ten o'clock. She nodded to the dressmaker whom she knew, and received a most respectful curtsy, and then sat down in an armchair near the mirror, picturesquely disposing the folds of her velvet dress. She did not cease to chatter with good-natured and merry volubility, constantly saying pleasant, flattering things about Natasha's beauty. She examined her dresses and praised them also managed to say a good word for a new dress of her own, en gauze métallique, metallic gauze, which she had just received from Paris, and advised Natasha to get one like it. Besides, it would be extremely becoming to you, my charmer, said she. 
Natasha's face fairly beamed with pleasure. She felt happy and exhilarated by the praise of this gracious Countess Buzokoya, who had heretofore seemed to her such an inaccessible grand lady, and was now so cordial toward her. Natasha's spirits rose, and she felt almost in love with this woman, who was so beautiful and so good-natured. Ellen, on her part, was sincerely enchanted by Natasha, and wanted her to have a good time. Anatole had urged her to help on his acquaintance with her, and it was for this purpose that she had called on the Rostovs. The idea of helping her brother in such a flirtation was amusing to her. Although that winter in Petersburg she had felt a grudge against Natasha for alienating Boris from her, it had now entirely passed from her mind, and, with all her heart, she felt kindly disposed toward Natasha. As she was taking her departure, she called her protégé aside. Last evening my brother dined with me. We almost died of laughing. He eats just nothing at all and can only sigh for you, my charmer. Il est fou. Mais fou amoureux de vous, ma chère. Natasha flushed crimson on hearing these words. How she blushes! How she blushes! Ma delicieuse, pursued Ellen, don't fail to come. Even if you are in love, that is no reason for making a nun of yourself. Even if you are engaged, I am sure that your future husband would prefer to have you go into society rather than die of tedium in his absence. Of course she knows that I am engaged. Of course she and her husband, she and Pierre, that good, honest Pierre, have talked and laughed about this. Of course there is no harm in it. And again under Ellen's influence, all that hitherto seemed terrible to her seemed simple and natural. And she is such a grande dame, and so kind, and she seems to like me so heartily, said Natasha to herself. And why shouldn't I have a good time? queried Natasha, looking at Ellen with wide eyes full of amazement. Maria Dmitrievna returned in time for dinner, silent and solemn, having evidently suffered a rebuff at the old prince's. She was still laboring under too much excitement from her encounter to be able to give a calm account of it. To the Count's question she replied that everything would be all right, and she would tell him about it the next day. When she was informed of the Count Buzukaya's visit, and the invitation for the evening, she said, "'I don't like the idea of your going to the Buzukaya's, and I should advise you not to. However, if you have already promised, go. Perhaps you will have some amusement,' she added, addressing Natasha." End of chapter 12Part 5, Chapter 13 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter 13 Count Ilya Andreyitch took his young ladies to the Countess Buzakaya's. The reception was fairly well attended, but the most of the company were strangers to Natasha. Count Ilya Andreyitch saw with dissatisfaction that the larger majority of those present consisted of men and women noted for their free and easy behavior. Mademoiselle Georges stood in one corner of the drawing-room surrounded by young men. There were a number of Frenchmen, and among them Mitivier, who since Ellen's arrival had become an intimate at her house. Count Ilya Andreyitch decided not to take a hand at the card-table or to leave the girls, but to take his departure as soon as Mademoiselle Georges had finished her recitation. Anatole was at the door, evidently on the lookout for the Rostovs. As soon as he had exchanged greetings with the Count, he joined Natasha, and followed her into the room. The moment she saw him, she was assailed, just as she had been at the theatre, by a mixed sense of gratified vanity that she pleased him, and of fear, because of the absence of moral barriers between him and her. Ellen received Natasha effusively, and was loud in praise of her beauty and her toilette. Soon after their arrival, Mademoiselle Georges retired from the room to change her costume. In the meantime, chairs were disposed in the drawing-room, and the guests began to take their seats. Anatole procured a chair for Natasha, and he was just going to sit next to her, but the Count, keeping sharp eye on his daughter, took the seat next to her. Anatole sat behind. Mademoiselle Georges, with plump and dimpled arms all bare, and with a red shawl flung across one shoulder, came out into the space around which the chairs were ranged, and assumed an unnatural pose. A murmur of admiration was heard. Mademoiselle Georges threw a stern and gloomy glance around, and began to recite certain lines in French, in which the guilty love of a mother for her son is delineated. In places she raised her voice, then again she spoke in a whisper, triumphantly tossing her head, 
and in other places she broke short off, or spoke in deep, hoarse tones, rolling her eyes. Adorable, divine, de la Sioux, were the acomiums heard on all sides. Natasha's eyes were fastened on the stout actress, but she heard nothing, saw nothing, understood nothing of what was going on before her. She felt that she was irrevocably drawn again into that strange, mad world, so far removed from the past world, where it was impossible to know what was right and what was wrong, what was reasonable and what was foolish. Behind her sat Anatole, and she was conscious of his nearness, and with terror awaited some development. After the first monologue, the whole company arose and crowded around Mademoiselle Georges, expressing their delight and enthusiasm. "'How beautiful she is,' said Natasha to her father, who had got up with the rest and was starting to push his way through the throng toward the actress. "'I cannot think so when I look at you,' said Anatole, sitting down next to Natasha. He spoke so that no one else could hear what he said. "'You are charming. Since the first moment that I saw you I have not ceased.' "'Come, let us go, Natasha,' interrupted the Count, returning to his daughter. "'How pretty she is!' Natasha, making no reply, followed her father, but gave Anatole a look of wondering amazement. After several more recitations, Mademoiselle Georges took her departure, and the Countess Buzakaya invited her guests into the ballroom. The Count wanted to go home, but Ellen begged him not to spoil her improvised ball. The Rostovs remained. Anatole took Natasha out for a valse, and while they were on the floor, and he clasped her waist and hand, he told her that she was revisante, and that he loved her. During the écoles, which she danced with Kurigan also, Anatole said nothing to her while they were by themselves, but merely gazed at her. Natasha was in doubt whether she had not dreamed what he said to her during the valse. At the end of the first figure he again pressed her hand. Natasha lifted startled eyes to his, but his look and his smile had such an expression of self-confidence and flattering tenderness that she found it impossible to look at him and say to him what was on her tongue to say. She dropped her eyes. "'Do not say such things to me. I am betrothed. I love another,' she hurriedly whispered. She glanced at him. Anatole was not in the least confused or chagrined at what she had said. "'Don't speak to me about that. What difference does it make to me?' he asked. I tell you, I am madly, madly in love with you. Am I to blame because you are bewitching? It's our turn to lead. Natasha, excited and anxious, looked around with wide, frightened eyes, and gave the impression of being gayer than usual. She remembered almost nothing of what took place that evening. While they were dancing the écoles and the Grossvater, her father came and urged her to go home with him, but she begged to stay a little longer. Wherever she was, Whomever engaged her in conversation, she was conscious all the time of his eyes upon her. Afterwards she remembered asking her father's permission to go to the dressing-room to adjust her dress, and how Ellen followed her, and told her with a laugh that her brother was in love with her. She remembered how, in the little divan room, she had again met Anatole, how Ellen had suddenly disappeared, leaving her alone with him, and how Anatole, seizing her hand, had said in a tender voice, "'I cannot call upon you, but must I never see you?' I love you madly, desperately. Can I not see you? And then, blocking her way, he had bent down his face close to her face. His great, gleaming, masculine eyes were so near to her face that she could see nothing else except those eyes of his. Nathalie, she heard his voice whisper, with a questioning inflection, and her hand was squeezed almost painfully. Nathalie? I do not understand at all. I have nothing to say, said her glance. His glowing lips approached her lips, but at that instant she felt that her deliverance had come, for the sound of Ellen's footstep and the rustle of her dress were heard in the room. Natasha glanced at Ellen, then blushing and trembling she gave him a terrified, questioning look, and started for the door. Un mot, un seul, un nom de Dieu, said Anatole. She paused. She felt that it was necessary for her to hear that single word which would afford her an explanation of what had happened and allow her something tangible to answer. Nathalie, un mot, un sol, he kept repeating, evidently not knowing what to say, and he repeated it until Ellen came close to him. Ellen and Natasha returned together to the drawing-room. Declining the invitation to stay to supper, the Rostovs went home. That night Natasha could not sleep at all. She was tormented by the question which she could not answer, which she loved, Anatole or Prince Andrei, she loved Prince Andrei. 
she had a very distinct remembrance of how warmly she loved him. But she loved Anatole also, there could be no doubt about that. Otherwise how could all of this have taken place, she asked herself. If it was possible for me, on saying good-bye to him, to answer his smiles with smiles, if I could permit myself to go so far, then of course I was in love with him at first sight. He certainly is good, and noble, and handsome, and it is impossible not to be in love with him. What can I do when I love him, and love the other, too, she asked herself, and found no solution to the vexing problem. End of chapter 13 Part Five, Chapter Fourteen of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter Fourteen. Morning came with its usual occupations and bustle. All arose, stirred about, engaged in talk. Once more the modiste came. Again Maria Dmitrievna appeared and summoned them down to tea. Natasha, with wide-opened eyes, as though trying to anticipate and intercept every glance fixed upon her, looked anxiously about, and struggled to seem the same as usual. After breakfast, which was her favorite time, Marya Dmitrievna sat down in her easy-chair, and called Natasha and the old count to her. Well, with strong emphasis on the word, well, my friends, now I have thought the whole matter over, and this is my advice, she began. Yesterday, as you know, I went to see Prince Nikolai. Well, again with strong emphasis, I had an interview with him. He thought to shout me down, but I am not to be shouted down so easily. I had it all out with him. Well, what did he do? asked the Count. What did he do? He's a raving maniac, won't listen to anything. Well, what's the use of talking? And, meanwhile, we are tormenting this poor girl so, said Marya Dmitrievna. And my advice to you is to transact your business and go home, to Otradnoye, and there wait till— Oh, no! cried Natasha. Yes, you must go, maintained Marya Dmitrievna, and wait there. If your betrothed should come here now, there would infallibly be a quarrel. But if he is here alone with the old man, they will talk the whole thing over calmly, and then he will come for you. Ilya Andreyitch approved of this plan, which instantly appealed to his good judgment. If the old prince was appeased, then they could rejoin him at Moscow or Louisa Gurie. If not, as it would be contrary to his wishes, then the wedding could take place at Otronoya. "'That is true as gospel,' said he. "'Only I am sorry that I went there and took her,' said the old count. "'There is nothing to be sorry for. As long as you were here you couldn't help paying him that mark of respect.' "'Well, if he does not approve, it is his affair,' said Marya Dmitrievna, making search for something in her reticule. "'Besides, the trousseau is all ready, so what have you to wait for? And what isn't ready I will send to you. Indeed, I am sorry about it, but you would be much better off to return, and God be with you.' Having succeeded in finding what she was searching for, she handed it to Natasha. It was a letter from the Princess Marya. "'She's written to you. How she torments herself, poor soul!' She is afraid you will imagine that she does not like you. Well, and she doesn't like me, said Natasha. Nonsense! Don't say such a thing, cried Marya Dmitrievna. I take no one's opinion. I know she does not like me, said Natasha boldly, snatching the letter, and her face assumed such an expression of hard and angry determination that it caused Marya Dmitrievna to look at her more closely and frown. Don't you contradict me that way, Matushka, said she. What I tell you is the truth. Go and reply to her letter. Natasha made no rejoinder, and retired to her own room to read the Princess Maria's letter. The princess wrote that she was in despair, owing to the misunderstanding that had arisen between them. Whatever were her father's feelings, she wrote, she besought Natasha to be assured that it was impossible for her not to love her, as the choice of her brother, for whose happiness she was ready to sacrifice everything. Moreover, she wrote, do not imagine that my father was unkindly disposed toward you. He is old and feeble, and you must excuse him. But he is good and generous, and will not fail to love the one who can make his son happy. The princess further asked Natasha to appoint a time when they could have another meeting. After reading the letter through, Natasha sat down at the writing-desk to pen a reply. Share princess, she wrote, 
hastily and mechanically, and paused. What more could she write, after all that had taken place the evening before? Yes, yes, all that is past, and now, already, everything is different, she said to herself, as she pondered over the letter that refused to be written. Ought I to reject him? Is it really my duty? It is frightful. And, to escape from these terrible thoughts, she went to Sonya, and began to help her pick out her embroidery patterns. After dinner, Natasha again retired to her room, and took up the Princess Maria's letter. "'Can it be that all is really over between us?' she mused. "'Can it be that this has happened so quickly, and that all that is past is completely annihilated?' She recalled, in all its intensity, her love for Prince Andrei, and yet, at the same time, she felt that she was in love with Kuragin. She vividly pictured herself as Prince Andrei's wife, and recalled those dreams of happiness with him which she had so many times enjoyed in imagination. And at the same time, fired with passionate emotions, she recalled every detail of her last meeting with Anatole. Why, could it be possible to love them both at once? She more than once asked herself, in the depths of perplexity. Then only could I be perfectly happy. But now I must choose, and I cannot be happy to be deprived of either of them— one thing is certain, she thought, to tell Prince Andrei what has happened, or to hide it from him, is impossible, but as far as he is concerned no harm has been done. Can I break off forever, though, with that delicious love for Prince Andrei, to whom my life has been devoted so long? Barushnya, said the maid in a whisper, and coming into the room with a mysterious face, a nice little man told me to give you this. The maid handed her a note. Only for Christ's sake, she exclaimed, as Natasha, without thinking mechanically, broke the seal and began to read. It was a love letter from Anatole, and, while she did not comprehend a word of it, she comprehended enough to know that it was from him, from the man she loved. Yes, she loved him. How else could happen what had happened? How could she have in her hand a love letter from him? With trembling hands Natasha held this passionate love letter, composed for Anatole by Dolokhov, and in reading it she found it contained what corresponded to everything which it seemed to her she herself felt. Last evening decided my fate. You must love me, or I die. I have no other alternative. So the letter began. Then he proceeded to say that he knew her parents would not consent to her marriage to him for various secret reasons, which he could reveal to her alone, but that if she loved him, it was enough for her to say the little word, yes, and no mortal power could suffice to destroy their bliss. Love conquers all. He would spirit her away and fly with her to the ends of the earth. Yes, yes, I love him, mused Natasha, as she read the letter over for the twentieth time and tried to discover some peculiarly deep meaning in every word. That evening, Maria Dmitrievna was going to the Arkharovs, and she invited the young ladies to accompany her. Natasha, under the pretext of a headache, remained at home. End of chapter 14Part 5, Chapter 15 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter 15 Sonya, on her return late that evening, went to Natasha's room, and, to her amazement, found her still dressed and asleep on the sofa. On the table near her lay Anatole's letter, wide open. Sonya picked the letter up and proceeded to read it. She read it through, and gazed at the sleeping Natasha, trying to discover in her face some key to the mystery of what she had read, and finding none. The expression of Natasha's face was calm and sweet and happy. Sonya, pale and trembling, with fright and emotion, clutching her breast lest she should choke, sat down in an easy chair and melted into tears. How is it I have seen nothing of this? How can this have gone so far? Is it possible she has ceased to love Prince Andre? And how can she tolerate this Kuragin? He is a deceiver and a scoundrel, that is evident. What will Nicholas do, dear, noble Nicholas, when he learns of this? So this is what caused her agitation and unnatural behavior for the last three days, said Sonya to herself. But it is impossible that she is in love with him. Most likely she opened the letter without knowing from whom it came. 
In all probability she was offended. She couldn't have done such a thing knowingly. Sonya wiped away her tears and went close to Natasha and scrutinized her face. Natasha, she murmured, almost inaudibly. Natasha awoke and looked at Sonya. Ah, are you back already? And in the impulse of the sudden awakening she gave her friend a warm and affectionate hug. But instantly noticing that Sonya's face was troubled, her face also became troubled and suspicious. Sonya, have you been reading that letter? she asked. Yes, murmured Sonya. Natasha smiled triumphantly. No, Sonya, it is impossible to hold out any longer, said she. I cannot hide it from you any more. You know, we love each other. Sonya, my darling, he has written me. Sonya. Sonya, not believing her own ears, stared at Natasha with open eyes. But Volkonsky, she exclaimed. Ah, oh, Sonya, ah, oh, if you could know how happy I am, cried Natasha. You can't imagine what such love is. But, Natasha, do you mean to say that the other is all at an end? Natasha gazed at Sonya with wide open eyes, as though she did not understand her question. What? Have you broken with Prince Andre? demanded Sonya. Ugh, oh, you can't comprehend it. Don't talk nonsense. Listen to me, said Natasha, with a flash of ill temper. No, I cannot believe this, insisted Sonya. I cannot understand it. How can you have loved one man a whole year and then suddenly? Why, you have only seen him three times. Natasha, I don't believe you. You are joking. In three days to forget everything? And so... Three days, interrupted Natasha. It seems to me as if I had loved him for a hundred years. It seems to me as if I had never loved anyone else before him. You cannot comprehend it. Sonya, wait. Sit down. Natasha threw her arms around her and kissed her. I have been told, and you have probably heard, that such love as this existed. But now for the first time I experience it. It is not like the one before. The moment I set eyes on him, I felt that he was my master, that I was his slave, and that I could not help loving him. Yes, his slave. Whatever he commands me, I obey him. You can't understand that. What can I do? What can I do, Sonya? pleaded Natasha, with a happy, frightened face. But just think what you are doing, insisted Sonya. I cannot let this go on, this clandestine correspondence. How could you permit him to go so far? asked she, with a horror and aversion which she had tried in vain to hide. I have told you, replied Natasha, that I have no will about it. Why can't you understand? I love him. Then I will not let it go any farther. I shall tell the whole story, cried Sonya, with a burst of tears. For God's sake, I beg of you. If you tell, you are not my friend, exclaimed Natasha. Do you wish me to be unhappy? Do you wish to separate us? Seeing how passionately excited Natasha was, Sonya shed tears of shame and regret for her friend. "'But what has passed between you?' she asked. "'What has he said to you? Why doesn't he come to the house?' Natasha made no reply to this question. "'For God's sake, Sonya, don't tell anyone. Don't torment me,' entreated Natasha. "'Remember, it's never right to interfere in such matters. I have trusted you.' "'But why all this secrecy?' Why doesn't he come to the house? insisted Sonya. Why doesn't he openly ask for your hand? You know Prince Andre gave you absolute freedom, if such were the case. But I don't believe in this man. Natasha, have you considered what his secret reasons may be? Natasha gazed at Sonya with wondering eyes. Evidently this question had not occurred to her before, and she knew not what answer to make. What reasons? I don't know. But of course there must be reasons. Sonya sighed and shook her head incredulously. "'If there were reasons,' she began, but Natasha, foreseeing her objections, with frightened eagerness interrupted her. "'Sonya, it is impossible to doubt him. Impossible! Wholly impossible! Don't you understand?' she cried. "'Does he love you?' "'Love me!' repeated Natasha, with a smile of contemptuous pity for her friend's incredulity. "'You have read his letter. You have seen him, haven't you?' But if he were a dishonorable man... He? A dishonorable man? If you knew him! exclaimed Natasha. 
If he were an honorable man, then he ought either to explain his intentions or else cease to see you. And if you are not willing to do this, then I shall. I shall write him. I shall tell your papa, said Sonya decidedly. But I can't live without him, cried Natasha. Natasha, I don't understand you. What are you saying? Think of your father. Think of Nicholas. I want no one. I love no one but him. How do you dare to assert that he is dishonorable? Don't you know that I love him? cried Natasha. Sonya, go. I don't wish to quarrel with you. Go away, for God's sake, go away. You see how tormented I am, screamed Natasha in a voice of repressed anger and despair. Sonya began to sob and rushed from the room. Natasha went to her writing table and, without pausing a moment, wrote the letter to the Princess Maria which she had not been able to write the morning before. In the letter she laconically informed the princess that all misunderstandings were at an end, that taking advantage of Prince Andrei's generosity and giving her perfect freedom, she begged her to forget all that had happened, and to forgive her if she had been to blame in respect to her, but that she could never be his wife. At that moment all seemed to her so easy, simple, and clear. The Rostovs were to start for the country on Friday, and on Wednesday the Count went with an intending purchaser to his Podmoskovnaya estate. On the day of the Count's trip, Sonya and Natasha were invited to a great dinner at the Kuragins, and Maria Dmitrievna went as their chaperone. At this dinner, Natasha again met Anatole, and Sonya observed that Natasha had some mysterious conversation with him, which she evidently wished not to be overheard, and during all the dinner time she seemed to be more agitated than ever. On their return home, Natasha was the first to begin the explanation which her friend was anxious for. "'There, Sonya, you have said all sorts of foolish things about him,' Natasha began, in a cajoling tone, such as children use when they want to be flattered. "'He and I came to a clear understanding today.' "'Now, what do you mean? What did he say, Natasha? How glad I am that you are not vexed with me. Tell me all, tell me the whole story. What did he say to you?' Natasha pondered. Ah, Sonya, if you only knew him as I do, he said, he asked me what sort of an engagement I had with Balkonsky. He was delighted that it depended on me to break it off. Sonya sighed mournfully. But you haven't broken your engagement with Balkonsky, have you? Well, perhaps I have broken my engagement with Balkonsky. Perhaps it is all at an end. What makes you have such hard thoughts of me? I have no hard thoughts of you. Only I can't understand this. Wait, Sonya, and you will understand the whole thing. You will learn what a man he is. But don't harbor hard thoughts of me, or of him, either. I harbor no hard thoughts of anyone. I love you, and I am sorry for you all. But what am I to do? Sonya, however, was not blinded by the affectionate manner in which Natasha treated her. The more gentle and insinuating Natasha's face grew, the more stern and serious became Sonya's face. Natasha, said she, you yourself begged me not to say any more about this to you, and I have not, and now you reopen it yourself. Natasha, I don't have any faith in him. Why all this mystery? There, you begin again, interposed Natasha. Natasha, I am afraid for you. Why should you be afraid for me? I am afraid that you are going to your ruin, said Sonya, in a resolute voice, frightened herself at what she said. An angry look again came into Natasha's face. "'I will go to my ruin. I certainly will. And the faster the better. It's no affair of yours. It won't hurt you, even if it does hurt me. Leave me. Leave. I hate you.' "'Natasha!' expostulated Sonya, in dismay. "'I hate you. I hate you. We can never be friends any more.' Natasha rushed out of the room. Natasha had nothing more to say to Sonya, and she avoided her. With that peculiar expression of nervous preoccupation and guilt, she wandered up and down the rooms, trying one occupation after another, and instantly abandoning them. Hard as this was for Sonya, she did not let her out of her sight for a single moment, but followed her everywhere she went. On the day before the Count's return, Sonya observed that Natasha spent the whole morning at the parlor window, as though in expectation of someone— and that she made some sort of signal to an officer who drove by, and who Sonya thought must have been Anatole. Sonya began to observe her friend still more closely, and remarked that during all dinner-time and throughout the evening 
Natasha was in a strange and unnatural state of excitement, answering at random the questions that were asked her, beginning and not finishing sentences, and laughing at everything. After tea, Sonya saw a timid chambermaid watching for her at Natasha's door. She let her pass in, and listening at the keyhole discovered that she was the bearer of another letter. And suddenly it became clear to Sonya that Natasha had some terrible plan on foot for that evening. Sonya knocked loudly at the door. Natasha refused to admit her. "'She is going to elope with him,' said Sonya to herself. "'She is quite ready for anything. Her face today had a peculiarly pitiful and determined expression. She wept when she said good-bye to her father yesterday,' Sonya remembered. "'Yes, it is evident that she is going to elope with him. What can I do about it?' mused Sonya, now recalling all the circumstances that made her think Natasha had adopted some terrible resolution. "'The Count is away. What can I do?' write to Kurrigan and demand of him an explanation. But who would make him reply to it? Write to Pierre, as Prince André told me to do in case of misfortune? But perhaps she has already broken with Volkonsky. Certainly Natasha sent her letter to the princess last evening. If her father were only here! It seemed terrible to tell Marya Dmitrievna, who had such confidence in Natasha. But what else can I do? mused Sonya, as she stood in the dark corridor. Now or never is the time to show that I am grateful to this dear family, and that I love Nicholas. No, even if I have to stay awake for three nights, I will not leave this corridor, and I will detain her by main force, and I will not allow any scandal to happen to this family, she said to herself. End of chapter 15《パート5》チャプター16《War and Peace》by Leo Tolstoy、translated by Nathan Haskell Dole。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne。Chapter 16 Anatole had recently transferred his lodgings to Dolokhov's house. The plan of abducting the young countess had been suggested and arranged by Dolokhov some days before, and on that day when Sonya, listening at Natasha's door, had determined to protect her. This scheme was already to be carried into execution. Natasha had agreed to meet Kurrigan at ten o'clock that evening at the rear entrance. Kurrigan was to place her in a trioka, which should be in waiting, and carry her sixty verse to the village of Kamienko, where an unfrocked pope would be in readiness to perform the mock marriage ceremony. At Kamienko, a relay would be ready to take them toward Warsaw, and thence by regular stages they would make their escape abroad. Anatole had his passport, and his Podoroznoya, or order for post-horses, and ten thousand roubles obtained from his sister, and ten thousand obtained through Dolokhov's mediation. Two witnesses, Vostokov, formerly a law clerk who is now a creature of Dolokhov's, and Makarin, a hussar on the retired list, a weak and good-natured fellow who had an inordinate affection for Kurrigan, were sitting in the front room over their tea. In Dolokhov's large cabinet, the walls of which were hung from floor to ceiling with Persian rugs, bearskins, and weapons, sat Dolokhov himself in a travelling beshmet and top-boots before an open desk, on which lay bills and packages of money. Anatole, in his uniform, unbuttoned, came in from the room where the two witnesses were sitting, and was passing through the cabinet into the adjoining room where his French valet and another servant were packing up the last remaining effects. Dolokhov was making out the accounts and writing the amounts on a sheet of paper. "'Well,' said he, "'you will have to give two thousand to Vostokov.' "'All right, give it to him,' said Anatole. "'Makarka'—this was an affectionate name for Makarin—is so disinterested that he would go through fire and water for you. "'There now, the accounts are all made out,' said Dolokhov, calling his attention to the paper. "'Is that right?' "'Yes, of course it is.' said Anatole, evidently not heeding what was said, and looking into vacancy with a dreamy expression and a smile that did not leave his face. Dolokhov shut the desk with a slam, and turned to Kurrigan with an amused smile. "'But see here now. You'd better give this up. There's still time,' said he. "'Fool! Durak!' said Anatole. "'Stop talking nonsense. If you only knew. But only the devil knows what this is to me. Honestly!' "'Throw it up,' said Dolokhov. "'I tell you the honest truth. "'Do you imagine that this is a joke that you are going into?' "'There you are, stirring me up again. "'Go to the devil!' exclaimed Anatole, scowling. 
I have no time to listen to your idiotic twaddle. And he started to leave the room. Dolokhov smiled scornfully and condescendingly as Anatole turned away. Wait, he cried after him. I am not joking. I am telling you the truth. Come here. Come here, I say. Anatole came back into the room again, and, trying to concentrate his attention, gazed at Dolokhov, apparently quite under the influence of his will. Listen to me, I suspect for the last time. Why should I jest with you? Have I done anything to thwart you? Who is it that has made all the arrangements for you? Who found your pope for you? Who procured your passport? Who got the money for you? Haven't I done the whole thing? Yes, and I thank you. Do you imagine I'm not grateful? Anatole sighed and embraced his friend. I have been helping you, but it is my place to tell you the truth. It is a dangerous game, and if it misses fire, a stupid one. Suppose you elope with her. Well and good. What will be the next step? It will be discovered that you are married. You will be prosecuted as a criminal. Ugh, what nonsense! What stupid nonsense! cried Anatole, frowning again. Haven't I told you again and again, eh? And Anatole, with that peculiar passion for argument characteristic of men of small intellects, when they want to show their wit, reiterated the considerations which he had laid before Dolokhov a hundred times. I have told you again and again. My mind is made up. If this marriage is invalid, said he, doubling over his finger, of course I am not responsible for it. Well, then, suppose it is valid. It's just the same, and when we are abroad, no one will know the difference. That's a fact, is it not? Say no more. Say no more. Say no more. But really, give it up. You will only get yourself into a scrape. Go to the devil, screamed Anatole, and, tearing his hair, he rushed into the next room, and then he came right back and sat down a straddle of a chair in front of Dolokhov. The devil only knows what this is to me, eh? Just see how it beats. He took Dolokhov's hand and put it on his heart. Ah, quel pied, mon cher, quel regard, un dies, eh? Dolokhov, smiling unsympathetically, looked at him out of his handsome, impudent eyes, evidently feeling inclined to have a little more sport out of him. Well, but when your money is gone, what then? What then? Eh? repeated Anatole, with a touch of genuine distress at the thought of the future. What then? I am sure I don't know. But what is the use of talking nonsense? He looked at his watch. It's time. Anatole went into the next room. Hurry up there. Aren't you almost ready? What are you dawdling so for? He cried, addressing the servants. Dolokhov put up the money, and, shouting to his man to have a lunch of eatables and drinkables prepared for the travellers for their journey, he went into the room where Vostokov and Makarin were waiting. Anatole had flung himself down on the ottoman in the cabinet, and, with his head resting on his hand, was dreamily smiling and whispering low and tender words. "'Come and have something to eat. Have a drink, then,' cried Dolokhov from the next room. "'I don't wish anything,' replied Anatole still with the smile on his handsome lips. Come, Balaga is here. Anatole got up and went into the dining room. Balaga was a famous Trioka driver who, for half a dozen years, had known Dolokhov and Anatole and had furnished them with teams. More than once, when Anatole's regiment had been at Tver, he had started at nightfall from Tver, set him down in Moscow before daybreak, and brought him back by the following morning. More than once he had taken Dolokhov out of the reach of pursuers. More than once he had taken them out to drive with gypsies and demochki, nice little dames, as Balaga called fast women. More than once, at their instigation, he had run down pedestrians and izvoschiks in the Moscow streets, and always his gentlemen, as he called them, had rescued him from the penalty. More than one horse he had broken down in their service. More than once he had been thrashed by them, Many times they had given him champagne and Madeira, which he specially affected, and he knew of escapades of theirs which would have condemned any ordinary man to Siberia. During their orgies, they had often invited Balaga to take part, and made him drink and dance with the gypsies, and more than one thousand roubles of theirs had passed through his hands. In service for them, he had twenty times a year risked life and limb, 
and in accompanying their deviltry he had almost killed more horses than their money would ever pay for but he was fond of them he was fond of that mad pace of eighteen versts an hour he was fond of upsetting some harmless ivoschek from his box or running down some pedestrian on the street crossings and of dashing at full tilt down the moscow highways he was fond of hearing behind him that wild cry of drunken voices pachol pachol when it was already a physical impossibility for his horses to carry them a step further and he was fond of winding his whiplash around a peasant's neck who shrank back more dead than alive as he passed by real gentlemen he called them anatol and dolokhov also were fond of balaga because of his masterly skill in handling the lines and because his tastes were similar to theirs with others he drove hard bargains charging twenty-five roubles for two hours outing and he rarely condescended to drive others himself but more frequently sent one of his subordinates but with his gentlemen as he called them he always went himself and never charged for his extra labor only when he learned through the valets that money was plentiful he would come after an interval of many months and very soberly and obsequiously bowing low asked to be helped out of his difficulties his gentlemen always made him take a seat you will excuse me bayushka fyodor ivanuitch or your illustriousness he would say i am entirely out of horses i pray you to advance me enough to go and get more at the yermanka and Anatol and Dolokhov, if they happened to be flush of funds, would give him a thousand or so roubles. Balaga was twenty-seven years old, a stubbed, red-haired, snub-nosed muzik, with fiery red complexion and still more fiery red neck, with glittering little eyes and a scrubby beard. He wore a fine, blue, silk-lined kaftan, and over that a sheepskin polushupka. He crossed himself, turning to the shrine corner, as he came in and advanced toward dolokhof holding out a small black hand fyodor ivanovitch your good health he exclaimed with a low bow how are you brother there he is good health your illustriousness said he addressing anatol who came in at that moment and offered him also his dirty hand i ask you balaga said anatol clapping his hand on his shoulder do you love me or not eh now there's a chance for you to prove it what horses have you come with eh those your man ordered your own wild ones said balaga now see here balaga no matter if you slaughter all three of your horses provided you get us there within three hours eh if we slaughter them how shall we get there replied balaga with a wink i'll smash your snout for you a truce to joking cried anatol suddenly with glaring eyes who's joking exclaimed the driver with a laugh do I ever grudge anything for my gentlemen? Whatever my horses can show in the way of speed, that we will do. Ah, grunted Anatol. Sit down, then. Yes, why not sit down, said Dolokhov. I will stand, Fyodor Ivanovitch. Sit down, no nonsense. Have a drink, said Anatol, and poured him out a great glass of Madeira. The driver's eyes flashed at the sight of the wine. Refusing at first, for manner's sake, he drank it down and wiped his mouth with a red silk handkerchief which he kept in the top of his cap well when shall we start your illustriousness let me see anatol glanced at his watch start pretty soon now see here balaga hey you will get there on time well it depends on the start if we get off luckily then we'll be there in good time i got you to tver once went there in seven hours don't you remember your illustriousness do you know when christmas we started from tver said anatol smiling at the remembrance and turning to makarin who was gazing affectionately at kuragin with all his eyes you wouldn't believe it makarka we flew so that it quite took away my breath we came upon one file of carts and jumped right over two of them eh what horses those were interposed balaga taking up the thread of the story at that time I put in two young side horses with the bay shaft horse, said he, turning to Dolokhov. You would hardly believe it, Fyodor Ivanuitch. Those wild creatures actually flew for sixty verse. It was impossible to hold them. My hands were numb, it was so cold. I threw down the lines. Look out for yourself, your illustriousness, said I, and rolled over backward into the sledge. It was hopeless to control them, or even to stick to my seat. The devils got us there in three hours. 
only the left one was winded. End of chapter 16part five chapter seventeen of war in peace by leo tolstoy translated by nathan haskell dole this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by marianne chapter seventeen anatole left the room and at the end of a few minutes came back in a sable shubka girded with a silver buckled leather belt and wearing a sable cap jauntily set on one side and very becoming to his handsome face glancing into the mirror and then taking the same posture before dolokhof which the mirror had told him was the most effective he seized a glass of wine well vidya good-bye prashkai thank you for everything prashkai said anatole well comrades friends he pondered a moment friends of my youth prashkaite he said turning to makarin and the others Although they were all going with him, Anatole evidently wanted to do something affecting and solemn on the occasion of this farewell. He spoke in a low, slow, deep voice, and throwing out his chest, he swayed a little as he rested his weight on one leg. All of you take your glasses. You too, Balaga. Well, comrades, friends of my youth, we have had jolly good times together. We have enjoyed life. We have been on many sprees, eh? Now, when shall we meet again? I am going abroad. Farewell. Prashkai, my boys, to your health. Hurrah! he cried, draining his glass and smashing it on the ground. To your good health! exclaimed Balaga, also draining his glass and wiping it with his handkerchief. Makarin, with tears in his eyes, embraced Anatole. Ugh, prince, how sad that we should have to part! he exclaimed. Come, let us be off! cried Anatole. Balaga was on the point of leaving the room. "'Hold on there. Wait,' said Anatole. "'Shut the door. We must sit down first. There, that's the way.' They closed the door and sat down, for the sake of the superstition. "'Well, now be off with you, boys,' said Anatole, getting up. Anatole's valet, Joseph, gave him his purse and sabre, and all flocked into the anteroom. "'But where is the shuba?' demanded Dolokhov. "'Hey, Ignatka!' Go to Matryona Matryevna and ask her for the shuba, the sable cloak. I know how girls go off on such occasions, exclaimed Dolokhov with a wink. She will come running out more dead than alive, dressed for staying in the house, and if you delay a moment too long, there will be tears, and O oh, Papasha and O oh, Mamasha, and she'll be cold and back she'll go. So be sure you take this shuba with you and have it all ready in the sledge. The valet brought a woman's cloak, lined with fox. "'You fool! I told you to get the sable! "'Hey, Matryoshka, bring the sable!' he shouted, his voice ringing down through the rooms. A handsome gypsy girl, though thin and pale, with brilliant black eyes and curly, purplish-black hair, with a red shawl over her shoulders, came hurrying out with the sable cloak over her arm. "'Why, I don't care. Take it,' said she, evidently afraid of her master, and yet regretting the cloak. Dolokhov, without heeding her, took the foxskin shuba, threw it over Matryosha, and wrapped it round her. So, said Dolokhov, and so, he repeated, as he pulled the collar up above her head, leaving only a small opening for her face. That's the way, do you see? And he moved Anatole's head towards the opening left by the collar, where Matryosha's brilliant smile could alone be seen. Well, good-bye, Matryosha. Prushkai, said Anatole, kissing her. Ech, my follies here are ended. Give my regards to Stioshka. Well, Prishkai, Matryoshka, wish me good luck. Well, then, Prince, God grant you the best of luck, said Matryosha in her gypsy accent. At the doorstep two triokas were waiting, with two jaunty Yamshchiks in attendance. Balaga was on the box of the first sledge and, with his elbows held high, was deliberately sorting the reins. Anatole and Dolokhov got in behind him. Makarin, Vostokov, and the valet took their places in the other trioka. All ready? inquired Balaga. Let her go, he cried, twisting the reins round his wrists, and the three horses flew like the wind down the Nikitsky Boulevard. The groom leaped down to hold the horses' heads by the curb, while Anatole and Dolokhov strode along the pavement. Coming to the gate, Dolokhov gave a low whistle. 
the whistle was returned, and immediately after a chambermaid came running out. "'Come into the court, else you will be seen. She'll be down presently,' said she. Dolokhov remained by the gate. Anatol followed the chambermaid into the dvor, turned the corner, and ran up the steps. Suddenly, Gravrilo, Maria Dmitrievna's colossal footman, met Anatol. "'Be good enough to go to my mistress,' said the footman, in a deep, bass voice, as he blocked all retreat from the door. "'Who's your mistress? Who are you?' demanded Anatol, in a breathless whisper. "'If you please, I was ordered to show you.' "'Kurgan, back!' cried Dolokhov. "'You are betrayed! Back!' Dolokhov, who had been left at the outside gate, was engaged in a tussle with the Dvornik, who was trying to shut it and prevent Anatol from returning through it. Dolokhov, with a final output of force, overturned the Dvornik, seized Anatol by the arm, pulled him through the gate, and ran together with him back to their trioka. End of chapter 17Part 5, Chapter 18 of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Maria Dmitrievna, finding the weeping Sonya in the corridor, had obliged her to confess the whole. Having got possession of Natasha's letter and read it, Maria Dmitrievna took it and confronted Natasha with it. Wretched girl! Shameless hussy! she said to her. I will not listen to a single word. Pushing away Natasha, who looked at her with wondering but tearless eyes, she shut her in under lock and key. Then she had ordered the Dvornik to admit into the courtyard anyone who might come that evening, but not to let them out again, and she had ordered the footmen to show such persons into her presence. Having made these arrangements, she took up her position in the drawing-room and waited for developments. When Gavrilo came in to inform Marya Dmitrievna that the abductors had escaped, she was very indignant. She got up, and for a long time paced up and down the room, with her hands clasped behind her back, deliberating on what she ought to do. At midnight she got the key out from her pocket and went into Natasha's room. Sonya was still sitting in the corridor, sobbing. "'Marya Dmitrievna, let me go to her, for God's sake,' said she. Marya Dmitrievna, giving her no reply, opened the door and went in. "'Disgusting! Abominable! In my house! Indecent, shameless hussy! Only I'm sorry for her father,' said Marya Dmitrievna, trying to master her indignation. "'Hard as it will be, I will bid them all hold their tongues, and I'll keep it from the Count.' Marya Dmitrievna entered the chamber with her firm step. Natasha was lying on the sofa, with her face hid in her hands. She did not stir, but lay in the same position in which Marya Dmitrievna had left her. "'Pretty conduct! Pretty conduct, indeed!' exclaimed Marya Dmitrievna. "'To make assignations with your lovers in my house! None of your hypocrisy! Listen when I speak to you!' Marya Dmitrievna shook her by the arm. "'Listen when I speak to you! You have disgraced yourself, like any common wench!' I'd settle this with you, but I have some pity for your father. I shall keep it from him. Natasha did not change her position, but her whole body began to shake with the noiseless convulsive sobs that choked her. Maria Dmitrievna glanced at Sonya and sat down on the sofa near Natasha. Lucky for him he escaped me, but I'll find him, said she, in her harsh voice. Do you hear what I am saying? She put her big hand under Natasha's face and turned it toward her. Both Marya Dmitrievna and Sonya were amazed when they saw her face. Her eyes were dry and glittering, her lips compressed, her cheeks hollow. Let me be. What do I care? I shall die, she murmured, turning away from Marya Dmitrievna with angry petulance and hiding her face in her hands again. Natalia, exclaimed Marya Dmitrievna, I wish you well. Lie there. Lie there if you wish. I won't touch you. But listen to me. I am not going to show you how blameworthy you have been. You know. But don't you see? Your father will be back tomorrow. What shall I say to him? Again Natasha's form was shaken by sobs. He will hear of it. And so will your brother. And so will your betrothed. I have no betrothed. I have refused him, cried Natasha. 
That is immaterial, pursued Maria Dmitrievna. Well, they will learn of it. Do you think they will forgive it? There's your father. I know him. If he should challenge him, would it be a good thing? Huh? Ugh, oh, leave me. Why should you have interfered at all? Why? Why? Who asked you to? screamed Natasha. Sitting up straight on the sofa and glaring angrily at Maria Dmitrievna. But what idea had you? demanded Maria Dmitrievna, again losing her patience. Were you kept locked up? Who on earth prevented him from coming to the house? Why must he needs carry you off like a gypsy wench? Well, now, suppose he had carried you off. Do you suppose we shouldn't have found him? Either your father, or your brother, or your betrothed? Well, he's a scoundrel, a knave, that's what he is. He's better than all of you put together, cried Natasha, sitting up very straight. If you had not meddled, ugh, my God, has it come to this? Has it come to this? Sonya, what made you? Go away. And she burst into a passion of tears, sobbing with the desperation such as only those feel who know that they are responsible for their own woes. Marya Dmitrievna began to speak once more, but Natasha cried, Go away! Go away! You all hate me! You all despise me! And she threw herself on the sofa again. Marya Dmitrievna continued for some time to give her advice and assure her that this whole affair ought to be kept a secret from the Count, that no one would know anything about it if only Natasha would try to let it all go and not betray in any one's presence that anything had happened. Natasha made no reply. She ceased to sob, but a fit of shivering and trembling came upon her. Marya Dmitrievna put a pillow under her head, covered her up with a couple of comforters, and herself brought her some linden flower, but Natasha had nothing to say to her. Now, let her go to sleep, said Marya Dmitrievna, and left the room, thinking that she would soon sleep. But Natasha did not go to sleep, and with wide, staring eyes, gazed into vacancy. She slept none that night, and she did not weep, and she did not speak to Sonya, who several times got up and went to her. On the following day, Count Ilya Andreyitch returned from his Podmoskovnaya in time for breakfast, as he had promised. He was in a most genial frame of mind. He had come to a satisfactory arrangement with his purchaser, and now there was nothing to detain him in Moscow, and away from his countess, whom he was very anxious to see. Marya Dmitrievna met him, and informed him that Natasha had been ill the day before, that they had sent for the doctor, and now she was better. Natasha that morning did not leave her room. With set, cracked lips, with wide, dry eyes, she kept her place by the window, and anxiously gazed at the passers-by in the street, and turned anxiously towards those who entered her room. She was evidently expecting news from him, expecting that either he would himself come or send her a letter. When the Count went to her, she heard the sound of his heavy steps, and turned round nervously, and then her face assumed its former expression of hauteur, and even anger. She did not even get up to meet him. "'What is the matter with thee, my angel? Are you ill?' asked the Count. Natasha hesitated. "'Yes, I am ill,' said she. In reply to the Count's anxious questions, why she was so cast down, and whether anything had happened to her lover, she assured him that nothing had happened, and begged him not to be disturbed. Maria Dmitrievna confirmed Natasha's statement that nothing had happened, but the Count, judging from the imaginary illness, and by his daughter's absent-mindedness, by the troubled faces of Sonya and Maria Dmitrievna, saw clearly that during his absence something must have happened. It was so terrible, however, for him to think that anything disgraceful had happened to his beloved daughter. He was so happy in his buoyant good spirits that he avoided asking any pointed questions, and tried hard to assure himself that nothing out of the way could have happened. And his only regret was that, on account of Natasha's indisposition, he was obliged to postpone their return to his country seat. End of chapter 18「Part Five, Chapter Nineteen of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter Nineteen. Pierre, on the day of his wife's arrival at Moscow, had made up his mind to take a journey somewhere so as to avoid being with her. 
Then, when the Rostovs came to Moscow, the impression produced upon him by Natasha made him hasten to carry out his intention. He went to Tver to see Iosip Alexievich's widow, who had some time since promised to put into his hands her husband's papers. On Pierre's return to Moscow, a letter was handed him from Maria Dmitrievna, who urged him to come and consult with her on some highly important business concerning Andrei Bolkonsky and his betrothed. Pierre had avoided Natasha. It seemed to him that he felt for her a sentiment stronger than was justifiable for a married man to harbor for his friend's mistress, and some perverse fate was constantly throwing them together. "'What can have happened, and what can it have to do with me?' he wondered, while dressing to go to Marya Dmitrievna's. "'It is high time for Prince Andrei to be back and marry her,' thought Pierre, as he set out for Mrs. Akrasimova's. On the Tversky Boulevard someone hailed him. "'Pierre, been back long?' cried a well-known voice. Pierre raised his head. It was Anatole and his inseparable companion, Magarin, dashing by in a double sledge, drawn by two grey trotters, that sent the snow flinging over the dasher. Anatole sat bolt upright, in the classic pose of dashing warriors, with his neck muffled in a beaver collar, and bending his head a little. His face was fresh and ruddy. His hat, with a white plume, was set jauntily on one side, exposing his curled and pomaded hair, dusted with fine snow. Indeed, he's a real philosopher, thought Pierre. He sees nothing beyond the enjoyment of the actual moment. Nothing annoys him, and consequently he is always jolly, self-satisfied, and calm. What would I give to be like him, thought Pierre, with a feeling of envy. In the anteroom of the Akrasimovas, a footman, who relieved Pierre of his shuba, told him that Maria Dmitrievna would receive him in her own room. As he passed through the music room, Pierre caught sight of Natasha sitting by the window with a strange expression of disdain on her pale, thin face. She gave him a glance, and frowned, and, with an expression of chilling dignity, left the room. "'What has happened?' asked Pierre, on entering Marya Dmitrievna's room. "'Pretty state of affairs,' replied Marya Dmitrievna. Fifty-eight years I have lived in this world, and I never saw anything so shameful.' And then, receiving Pierre's word of honor that he would keep secret what he should hear, Marya Dmitrievna confided to him that Natasha had broken her engagement with Prince Andrei without the knowledge of her parents, that the cause of this break was Anatole Kuragin, whom Pierre's wife had introduced to her, and with whom she had promised to elope during her father's absence in order to enter into a clandestine marriage. Pierre, with shoulders raised and mouth opened, listened to Marya Dmitrievna's story, not believing his own ears, that Prince Andrei's betrothed, that hitherto lovely Natasha Rostova, so passionately beloved, should give up Bolkonsky for that fool of an Anatole, who was a married man, for Pierre was in the secret of his marriage, and so be enamoured of him as to consent to elope with him, Pierre could not comprehend and could not imagine. Natasha's sweetness of character, he had known her since childhood, could not, in his mind, be associated with this new suggestion of baseness, folly, and cruelty in her. He remembered his own wife. They are all alike, he said to himself, thinking that he was not the only one who had had the misfortune to be in the toils of an unworthy woman, and at the same time he could have wept for his friend Prince Andrei, to whose pride it would be such a grievous blow. And the more he grieved for his friend, the greater scorn and even aversion he felt for Natasha, who had just passed by him with such an expression of haughty dignity in the music-room. He could not know that Natasha's soul was full to overflowing of despair, shame, and humiliation, and that she was not to blame for her face expressing, from very despair, that cold dignity and disdain. "'But how could he marry her?' exclaimed Pierre, catching at Marya Dmitrievna's last word. "'He could not marry her. He already has a wife.' "'Worse and worse!' exclaimed Marya Dmitrievna. "'Fine young man! What a dastard he is! And she has been waiting here these two days for him to come. At any rate, she must cease expecting him. We must tell her.' When she learned from Pierre all the details of Anatole's marriage, and had poured out the vials of her wrath against him in abusive words, Marya Dmitrievna explained to Pierre why she had asked him to call upon her. 
she was afraid that the Count or Bolkonsky, who was liable to return at any moment, might learn of the affair, in spite of all her efforts to keep it a profound secret, and might challenge Kuragin to a duel, and, therefore, she besought him to add his influence to hers in getting him to leave town and never show himself in her presence again. Pierre willingly agreed to fulfill her wishes, since now he for the first time realized the danger threatening the old Count and Nikolai and Prince André. Having preferred her request in short and precise terms, she took him back into the drawing-room. "'Mind you, the Count knows nothing of this. You must pretend that you also know nothing about it,' said she. "'And I am going this instant to tell her that she is to cease expecting him. And stay to dinner, if you will,' shouted back Maria Dmitrievna to Pierre. Pierre met the old Count. He was disturbed and annoyed. That morning Natasha had told him that she had broken her engagement with Bolkonsky. "'Too bad. Too bad, mon cher,' said he to Pierre. "'Too bad for these girls to be away from their mother. How sorry I am that I ever came at all. I am going to be frank with you. She has already broken her engagement without telling any one of us about it. Now I will admit that I never have been over-pleased at this engagement.' I will agree that he is a fine man and all that, but what would you have? There would not be much happiness if the father was opposed, and Natasha would not lack chances of getting married. Still, the affair has gone on so long, and to have such a step taken without consulting father or mother, and now she's sick, and God knows what's the matter. It's a bad thing, Count, a bad thing for daughters to be without their mother." Pierre perceived that the Count was very much disconcerted, and he tried to bring the conversation round to other topics, but the Count kept returning to his grievance. Sonya, with anxious face, came into the drawing-room. "'Natasha is not very well today. She is in her room. But she would like to see you. Marya Dmitrievna is with her, and would also like you to come.' "'Yes, certainly. You and Bolkonsky were good friends. She probably wants to send some message,' said the Count." Ugh, oh, my God, my God, how good it all was! And tearing at his thin locks, the Count left the room. Maria Dmitrievna had been explaining to Natasha how Anatole was married. Natasha refused to believe her and demanded to have confirmation of it from Pierre himself. Sonya confided this to Pierre as they passed along the corridor toward Natasha's room. Natasha, pale and stern, was sitting next to Maria Dmitrievna. The moment Pierre entered the doorway, she met him with feverishly glittering, wildly imploring eyes. She did not smile. She did not even greet him with a nod. She only looked at him eagerly, and her eyes merely demanded if he came as her friend or, like all the rest, as her enemy, in reference to Anatole. Pierre, in his own personality as Pierre, did not exist for her. "'He knows all about it,' said Maria Dmitrievna, indicating Pierre and addressing Natasha." Let him tell you, if I am not speaking the truth. Natasha, as a wounded animal at bay, glares at the dogs and huntsmen approaching, looked first at the one and then at the other. Natalia Ilyanichna, Pierre began, dropping his eyes and experiencing a feeling of compunction for her and of aversion to the operation which he was obliged to perform. It is true. Whether this is true or not true, as far as you are concerned, it cannot matter, because— then it is not true that he is married. Nay, it is true. Has he been married for some time? she asked. On your word of honor. Pierre gave her his solemn word of honor. Is he still in town? she asked hurriedly. Yes, I have just seen him. The effort to say more was evidently too much for her, and she made them a sign with her hand to leave her alone. End of chapter 19《Part Five, Chapter Twenty of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter Twenty. Pierre did not remain for dinner, but immediately took his leave. He went out for the purpose of finding Anatole Kuragin, the mere thought of whom now made all the blood rush to his heart and almost choke him. He sought him everywhere: at the ice hills, among the gypsies, at Komyanos but he was nowhere to be found. Pierre went to the club. There everything was going in its usual train. 
the members who were assembling for dinner formed little groups and greeting pierre spoke of various items of city gossip a servant who knew his habits and his particular friends accosted him politely and informed him that the place was ready for him at the little table that prince n n was in the library but that t t had not yet come one of pierre's acquaintances during some talk of the weather asked him if he had heard of kuragin's elopement with rostova about which the whole city were talking and if it were true pierre with a laugh said that it was all nonsense because he had just come from the rostovs he inquired of every one if they had seen anatole one said that he had not yet come another that he would be there to dinner it was strange for pierre to look at this tranquil indifferent throng of men who had not the slightest inkling of what was passing in his mind he then sauntered through the hall till all had gone in to dinner and then giving up expecting anatole he did not wait for dinner but went home anatole whom he was so anxious to find dined that day with dolokhof and was discussing with him some plan of still carrying out their ill-fated enterprise it seemed to him absolutely necessary to have an interview with natasha in the evening he went to his sister's in order to arrange with her some means of procuring this interview when Pierre, who had vainly ransacked all Moscow, returned home, the footman informed him that Prince Anatole Vasilyevich was with the Countess. The Countess's drawing-room was crowded with company. Pierre, not even greeting his wife, whom he had not seen since his return, never had she seemed to him more utterly detestable than at that moment, went into the drawing-room, and, catching sight of Anatole, went straight up to him. "'Ah, Pierre!' cried the Countess, approaching her husband. "'You don't know in what a position our Anatole,' she paused, when she saw the forward thrust of her husband's head, in his flashing eyes, and his resolute gait, the same strange, terrible expression of frenzy and might which she had known and experienced after his duel with Dolokhov. "'Sin and lewdness are with you everywhere,' said Pierre to his wife. "'Anatole, come with me. I want a few words with you,' he said in French." Anatole glanced at his sister, and boldly rose, ready to follow Pierre. Pierre took him by the arm and hurried him out of the room. "'Si vous vous permettez dans mon salon,' exclaimed Ellen in a whisper, but Pierre made no reply and left the room. Anatole followed him with his usual jaunty gait, but there was a trace of anxiety on his face. When they reached Pierre's cabinet he shut the door and addressed Anatole without looking at him. You promised to marry the Countess Rostova, and planned to elope with her. My dear, replied Anatole in French, in which language indeed the whole conversation was carried on. I consider myself under no obligation to answer questions asked in such a tone. Pierre's face, white to begin with, became perfectly distorted with rage. With his huge hand he seized Anatole by the collar of his uniform coat, and proceeded to shake him from side to side until the young man's face expressed a sufficient degree of terror when i tell you that i must have an answer from you now look here this is stupid ha huh? exclaimed anatole looking for the button that had been torn off from his collar you are a scoundrel and a blackguard and i don't know what restrains me from the satisfaction of smashing your head with this said pierre expressing himself with easy fluency because he spoke in french he had taken into his hand a heavy paperweight and he held it up menacingly and then slowly laid it back in its place again. "'Did you promise to marry her?' "'I... I... I don't think so. Besides, I couldn't have promised any such thing be because—' Pierre interrupted him. "'Have you any of her letters?' he demanded, coming close to him. Anatole gave him one look, and instantly put his hand into his pocket, and took out a pocket-book. Pierre seized the letter which he handed to him, and violently pushing aside a chair that was in his way, he went to the sofa and flung himself upon it. "'I will not hurt you. Have no fear,' said he, in reply to Anatole's terrified gesture. "'The letters. One thing,' said Pierre, as though repeating a lesson for his own edification. "'Secondly,' he continued, after a moment's silence, getting to his feet again and beginning to pace up and down the room, "'you must leave Moscow to-morrow.' but how can i thirdly pursued pierre not heeding him you must never breathe a word about what has taken place between you and the countess this i know i cannot oblige you to do but if you have a single spark of conscience pierre walked in silence several times from one end of the room to the other anatole had sat down by the table and was scowling and chewing his lips 
you must learn some time that above and beyond your own pleasure the happiness and peace of others are to be considered that you are ruining a whole life for the sake of having a little amusement trifle with women like my wife as much as you please with such you have fair game they know what you want of them they are armed against you by their very experience in lust but promise a young girl to marry her to deceive her to rob her why don't you know that it is as cowardly as to strike an old man or a child pierre stopped speaking and looked at anatole inquiringly his anger had vanished i don't know i'm sure huh said anatole gaining confidence in proportion as pierre's anger subsided i know nothing about it and i don't want to know said he not looking at pierre while at the same time his lower jaw trembled slightly but you have spoken to me words so insulting that I, as a man of honor, cannot think of permitting them. Pierre looked at him in amazement, perfectly unable to understand what he wanted of him. Though we have had no witnesses, continued Anatole, still I cannot. What? You wish satisfaction? asked Pierre scornfully. At least you can retract what you said, eh? That is, if you expect me to carry out your wishes, eh? "'I will. I'll take it back,' exclaimed Pierre. "'And I beg you to forgive me.' Pierre could not help looking at the torn button. "'And money, if you need it for your journey.' Anatole smiled. This contemptible, villainous smile, which he knew so well in his wife, stirred Pierre's indignation. "'Oh, contemptible, heartless race!' he exclaimed, and left the room. The next day Anatole started for Petersburg. End of chapter 20part five chapter twenty one of war and peace by leo tolstoy translated by nathan haskell dole this LibriVox recording is in the public domain recording by marianne chapter twenty one pierre went to maria dmitrievna's to inform her how he had accomplished her wishes in regard to anatole's expulsion from moscow he found the whole house in terror and commotion natasha was very ill and as maria dmitrievna informed him under a seal of secrecy the night after she had learned that Anatole Kurigan was married, she had poisoned herself with arsenic that she managed surreptitiously to procure. Having swallowed a considerable quantity, she awakened Sonya and confessed what she had done. The proper antidotes to the poison had been given in time, and she was now out of danger, but she was still so weak that it was out of the question to think of taking her to the country, and the countess had been sent for. Pierre saw the troubled count and the weeping Sonya, but he was not allowed to see Natasha. Pierre had that day dined at the club, and had heard on all sides gossip about the frustrated elopement, but he strenuously denied these rumors, assuring every one that there was nothing in it, except that his brother-in-law had offered himself to Rostova, and had been refused. It seemed plain to Pierre that it was his bounden duty to conceal the whole affair, and save Natasha's reputation. In a real panic he waited for Prince Andrei's return, and each day he went to the old prince's to inquire for news of him. Prince Nikolai Andreyitch had learned through Mademoiselle Burine of all this gossip flying through the city, and he had read the letter to the Princess Maria, in which Natasha broke off her engagement with Prince Andrei. This letter also he had obtained through Mademoiselle Burine, who had fetched it from the princess. He seemed in better spirits than usual, and awaited his son's return with the greatest impatience. When the latter finally reached Moscow, the old prince first thing handed him Natasha's letter to his sister, announcing her discontinuance of the engagement, and told him, with additions of his own invention, the various rumors current concerning the elopement. A few days after Anatole's departure, Pierre received a note from Prince Andrei announcing his arrival, and begging Pierre to come to see him. Since Prince Andrei's arrival had been in the evening, Pierre went to see him the following morning. He expected to find him in almost the same state of mind as Natasha was, and therefore great was his amazement when, on being shown into the drawing-room, he heard Prince Andrei in the adjoining cabinet, telling in a loud, animated manner of some Petersburg intrigue. He was occasionally interrupted by the old prince, and by a third person present. The Princess Maria came in to greet Pierre. She sighed as she turned her eyes towards the door of the room where her brother was, evidently anxious to give expression to her sympathy for his affliction, but Pierre detected on her face evidences of her inward gratification at the turn affairs had taken, 
and at the manner in which her brother had received the news of Natasha's fickleness. "'He told me that he expected this,' said she. "'I know that his pride would not let him make any show of his feelings, but nevertheless he bears up under it better, far better than I had any reason to expect, of course, since it had to be so.' "'But do you mean to say it is all over between them?' The Princess Maria looked at him in amazement. She could not understand how anyone should even ask such a question. Pierre went into the cabinet. Prince Andrei, much altered and evidently restored to perfect health, but with a new and perpendicular wrinkle between his brows, was standing in civil dress, in front of his father and Prince Mershersky, who was arguing eagerly, making forceful gestures. The topic was Speransky, news of whose unexpected banishment and reported treason had only just reached Moscow. Now, Prince Andrei was saying, the very men who a month ago were extolling him, and who are fully incapable of comprehending his aims, are criticizing him and condemning him. To criticize a man in disfavor is very easy, and so it is to make him responsible for the blunders of others. But I tell you, if any one has done any good during this present reign, it has been done by him, by him alone. He caught sight of Pierre and paused. A spasm passed over his face, and immediately his expression became stern. But posterity will do him justice, said he, and with that he turned to greet Pierre. Well, how are you? Stout as ever, he said in a lively tone, but the newly furrowed frown grew still deeper. Yes, I am well, he replied, in answer to Pierre's question, and laughed. Pierre saw clearly that this laugh was affected, and was simply equivalent to saying, well, but who cares whether I am well or ill? After exchanging a few words with Pierre in regard to the frightful traveling from the Polish frontier, and how he met in Switzerland a number of men who had known Pierre, and about Mr. de Salle, whom he had brought abroad as his son's tutor, Prince Andrei again, with feverish eagerness, returned to the topic of Speransky, which the two old men still kept on the tapis. If there had been any treason, and if there had been any proofs of his correspondence with Napoleon, then they would surely have been published broadcast, said he, speaking excitedly and fluently. Personally, I do not like Speransky, and I have not liked him in the past, but I do like justice. Pierre was aware that his friend was now laboring under that necessity, which he himself had only too often experienced, of getting thoroughly stirred up and excited over some alien topic, simply for the purpose of dispelling thoughts too heavy to be endured. When Prince Mershersky had taken his departure, Prince Andrei took Pierre's arm and drew him into the room which had been prepared for his occupancy. In this room a bed had been hastily set up. Trunks and boxes, opened, were scattered about. Prince Andrei went to one of these and took out a casket, and from the casket a packet wrapped in a paper. All this he did silently and very swiftly. He straightened himself up and cleared his throat. His face was gloomy and his lips compressed. Forgive me if I trouble you. Pierre perceived that Prince Andrei was going to speak about Natasha, and his broad countenance expressed pity and sympathy. This expression on Pierre's face nettled Prince Andrei. He went on in a loud, decided, and disagreeable voice. I have received my dismissal from the Countess Rostova, and rumors have reached my ears of your brother-in-law having offered himself to her, or something to that effect. Is that true? Whether true or false, Pierre began, but Prince Andrei interrupted him. Here are her letters and her miniature. He took the packet from the table and handed them to Pierre. Give this to the Countess, if you happen to see her. She is very ill, said Pierre. So she is still here, inquired Prince Andrei. And Prince Kurgan, he asked hastily. He went some time ago. She almost died. I am very sorry for her illness, said Prince Andrei. He smiled coldly, evilly, disagreeably, like his father. But Mr. Kurgan did not, then, honor the Countess Rostova with the offer of his hand, asked Prince Andrei. He snorted several times. It is impossible for him to marry, for the reason that he is already married, said Pierre. Prince Andrei gave a disagreeable laugh, again suggestive of his father. And where, pray, is he to be found, this precious brother-in-law of yours, may I ask, said he. He has gone to Peter... However, I don't really know, said Pierre. Well, it's all the same to me, said Prince Andrei. Assure the Countess Rostova that she has been, and is, perfectly free, 
and that I wish her all happiness. Pierre took the package of letters. Prince Andrei, as though trying to make up his mind whether it were not necessary for him to say something, or expecting Pierre to say something, looked at him keenly. See here. Do you remember a discussion we had once in Petersburg? Do you remember? Yes, I remember, said Prince Andrei hurriedly. I said that a fallen woman ought to be forgiven. But I did not say that in my own case I should forgive her. I cannot. But wherein is the comparison? asked Pierre. Prince Andrei interrupted him. His voice was loud and shrill. Yes, ask her hand again. Be magnanimous and all that. Yes, that would be very noble. But I am not capable of following in this gentleman's footsteps. If you wish to continue my friend, never mention this to me again. Not a word about it. Now good-bye. You will give this to her, will you? Pierre left the room and went to the old prince and the princess Maria. The old prince seemed more animated than usual. The princess was her ordinary self, but back of her sympathy for her brother, Pierre could see that she was delighted at having the engagement broken. As Pierre looked at them, he realized how deep were the scorn and dislike which they all felt toward the Rostovs. He realized that it was wholly helpless even to mention her name, though she might have had anyone else in the world in Prince Andrei's place. At dinner the conversation turned on the war which was unquestionably imminent. Prince Andrei kept up an unceasing stream of talk and discussion with his father, or with Mr. de Saul, his son's Swiss tutor, and he displayed more excitement than usual, and Pierre knew only too well the moral cause of this excitement. End of chapter 21《Part Five, Chapter Twenty Two of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter Twenty Two. That same evening, Pierre went to call upon the Rostovs to fulfill his commission. Natasha was in bed. The Count had gone to the club, and Pierre, having entrusted the letters into Sonya's hands, went to Maria Dmitrievna, who was greatly interested to know how Prince Andrei had received the news. Ten minutes later, Sonya appeared. "'Natasha is determined to see Count Pyotr Kirillovich,' said she. "'But how can he go to her room? Everything is in disorder there,' said Maria Dmitrievna. "'But she is dressed, and has come down into the drawing-room,' said Sonya. Maria Dmitrievna merely shrugged her shoulders. "'If only the Countess would come. This is a perfect torture to me. Now be careful and don't tell her everything,' she added warningly. It would break my heart if anything were said to hurt her. She is so to be pitied, so to be pitied. Natasha, grown decidedly thin, with pale, smileless face, though not at all confused, as Pierre supposed she would be, stood in the middle of the drawing-room. When Pierre made his appearance in the door, she hesitated, evidently undecided whether to go to him or wait for him. Pierre hastened forward. He supposed that she would, as usual, give him her hand. But she stood motionless, sighing deeply, and with her arms hanging lifelessly, in exactly the same pose that she always took when she went in the middle of the music-room to sing, only with an entirely different expression. "'Pyotr Kirillovich,' she began, speaking very swiftly, "'Prince Bolkonsky was your friend, and is still your friend,' she added by afterthought, for it seemed to her that everything was past, and all things had become new. He told me once to turn to you if— Pierre quietly blew his nose as he looked at her. Till that moment he had, in his heart, blamed her and tried to despise her, but now she seemed to him so eminently deserving of pity that there was no room in his heart for reproach. "'He is here now. Please ask him to for—forgive,' she paused— and breathed still faster, but she did not weep. "'Yes, I will tell him,' said Pierre. He knew not what to say. Natasha was evidently terrified by what Pierre might have thought she meant. "'Yes, I know that all is over between us,' she said, hurriedly. "'No, it can never be. All that tortures me is the wrong that I have done him. Only ask him to forgive. Forgive. Forgive me for all.' Her whole frame trembled, and she sat down in a chair. Never before had Pierre experienced such a feeling of compassion as now came over him. "'I will tell him. 
I will certainly tell him all, said Pierre. But I should like to know one thing. What? asked Natasha. I should like to ask if you loved. Pierre did not know what term to use in speaking of Anatole. Did you love that vile man? Don't call him vile, exclaimed Natasha. But I... I don't know. I don't know at all. Then the tears came again and a still more intense feeling of pity, affectionate compassion and love came over Pierre. He was conscious of the tears welling out from under his spectacles and dropping, and he hoped that they would not be seen. Let us say no more about it, my dear, said Pierre. Strange indeed suddenly seemed to Natasha the sound of his voice, so sweet, so tender, so sincere. Let us say no more about it, my dear. I will tell him all, but one thing I want to ask you. Consider me your friend, and if you need any help or advice, or simply if you need someone in whom you can confide, not now, but by and by, when everything is clear to your own mind, remember me. He took her hand and kissed it. I should be happy if I were in the position to... Pierre grew confused. Do not speak to me so. I do not deserve it, cried Natasha, and she started to leave the room. But Pierre detained her by the hand. He knew that there was something more he must tell her, but when he had spoken it, he was amazed at his own words. Wait, wait. All life is before you, said he. Before me? Before me is only ruin, she exclaimed, in the depths of shame and self-reproach. Ruin, he repeated. If I were not myself, but the handsomest, wisest, and best man in the world, and were free, I would this very instant, on my knees, sue for your hand and your love. Natasha, for the first time in many days, wept tears of gratitude and emotion, and, giving Pierre one look, she fled from the room. Pierre followed her, almost running, and restraining the tears of tenderness and happiness that choked him throwing his shuba over his shoulders, but without putting his arms through the sleeves, he went out and got into his sledge. "'Where now?' asked the driver. "'Where?' repeated Pierre to himself. "'Where can I go now? To the club, or to make some calls? All men at this moment seemed to him so contemptible, so mean, in comparison with that feeling of emotion and love which had overmastered him, in comparison with that softened glance of gratitude which she had given him just now through her tears. Home, said Pierre, throwing back his bearskin shuba and exposing his broad, joyfully throbbing chest, though the mercury marked ten degrees of frost. It was cold and clear, above the dirty, half-lighted streets, above the black roofs of the houses, stretched the dark, starry heavens. Only as Pierre gazed at the heavens above, he ceased to feel the humiliating pettiness of everything earthly in comparison with the height to which his soul aspired. As he drove out on the Arbatskaya Square, the mighty expanse of the dark, starry night spread out before Pierre's eyes. Almost in the zenith of this sky, above the Prechentensky Boulevard, convoyed and surrounded on every side by stars, but distinguished from all the rest by its nearness to the earth, and by its white light, and by its long curling tail, stood the tremendous, brilliant comet of 1812, the same which men thought presaged all manner of woes and the end of the world. But in Pierre, this brilliant luminary, with its long train of light, awoke no terror. On the contrary, rapturously, his eyes wet with tears, he contemplated this glorious star which seemed to him to have come flying with inconceivable swiftness through measureless space, straight toward the earth, there to strike like an enormous arrow, and remain in that one fate designated spot upon the dark sky, and, pausing, raise aloft with monstrous face its curling tail, flashing and playing with white light, amid the countless other stars doomed to perish. It seemed to Pierre that this star was the complete reply to all that was in his soul flowing into new life, and filled with tenderness and love. End of chapter 22 and end of part five. Also, this is the end of volume two of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Dole.